Hello, everyone. Welcome to RegenMed Global, the podcast, where we bring you the newest breakthroughs in medicine and research to help bring hope in fighting incurable diseases. My name is Shyam. Today, we're here to discuss a potential treatment for multiple system atrophy using GDNF gene therapy in the clinical trial stages. With us, we have principal investigator of this research, Dr. Nicholas Philippe from UCI. You mind maybe just uh, telling us a little bit about briefly about what you do? Yes, sure. My my pleasure here, Shayan. Um, so I'm a, a Parkinson's and movement disorders neurologist. Um, I take care of patients with Parkinson's disease um, and uh, participate in as well as in clinical research, uh, trying to find you know treatments to alleviate these conditions, uh, hopefully to slow them down, and hopefully one day maybe find the cure. Uh, so we, we are part of a group here at UCI and we collaborate with other, you know, people that are interested in, in helping patients. What is this GDNF gene therapy? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, yes. So um, as, as with many things in medicine, we kind of take advantage of, of what we know about uh, the body and biology. So we know that, for example, different diseases would get to us through viruses or viruses themselves, uh, you know, get into our body. So we, we are taking advantage of what viruses can do to do something good or we think that may be good. Essentially, we are kind of uh, using a virus to host a little uh, chunk of, of DNA uh, called, um, you know, uh, double-stranded DNA. So a little amount of DNA that gets into our brain, hopefully uh, to produce, uh, it's not hopefully, you know, there is a lot of data showing that it can produce like a youth potion for your cells, for your neurons called glial derived neurotrophic factor. You know, glial means that it comes from glial cells. Derive is that derived, it's derived from those cells. And neurotrophic means that it feeds neurons, so it helps them be young and healthy. Factor is just this uh, biological compound. So essentially, um, this is what we are trying to, to help our patients test uh, and, and, you know, uh, benefit from, hopefully. Is this treatment being used for any other particular diseases, or is this the uh, kind of first time we're utilizing this? So, so this uh, glial-derived neurotrophic factor has been tested in, in other disorders. Uh, so we have conducted, a, we are conducting still a trial very similar in Parkinson's disease patients. It's important also to keep in mind that these are small uh, numbers of patients. Um, namely, when you first start testing things like this, one of the main points or the main point of uh, outcome is safety, right? That it is safe. Um, so first we test for safety, and then we test for clinical benefits, right? How is it improving things? But first, no harm, uh, and then uh, how can we improve or help patients? Are there any treatments right now, or is this could this be the first potential treatment out there? So, the, you know, it depends on, on how the, the question is framed, right? Um, we don't have pay, uh, treatments that can slow down or cure the disease, uh, we do have some treatments that can alleviate symptoms, but again, it does not stop the disease from advancing, from progressing, and it is essentially still a, a very complex disease uh, causing significant problems to patients. So we are hoping that uh, this treatment or similar treatments will be the first one to slow down the disease or alleviate symptoms in a more permanent fashion. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of how this clinical trial looks like? Yes. Um, as a, what we call phase one studies, namely small number of patients where we are testing for safety, this study runs through a one year. Um, the first uh, interviews are essentially to be sure that we are selecting the proper candidates with the proper condition for which the intervention was uh, designed, right? So do you truly have the condition we want to treat. So, you know, we examine our patients with physical examination, brain images, some blood work. And once we know that the candidate is the proper candidate, um, we hold a thorough discussion exactly as you and I are having on what are the possible risks, what are the benefits, etc. 
Um, and once we are all in agreement, the patient starts the study. Um, they do uh, receive one uh, extra test, the lumbar puncture. So it's a small sample of cerebrospinal fluid that is taken from the back. Um, and patients go for a surgery. This is a minimally invasive surgery, if you want to call it. I'm calling it minimally invasive, not in the formal way of minimal invasive, but essentially this is a very small um, cannula that gets into the brain uh, and surrounds the movement areas, delivering this um, vector that we discussed before, this viral vector, this vehicle that would eventually lead the intervention to get into the neurons uh, where we want it to be. And so once the surgery is accomplished, we follow the patients again with physical examination, with brain images, um, and these are examined roughly every, patients are examined roughly every, not roughly, exactly every three months until the end of the study, that is one year of observation. What kind of results or what kind of outcomes do you, or just in general, do you guys expect to see from, uh, from this treatment, from this clinical trial? As, as the initial phase, one of the main outcomes uh, we are looking for is finding that there are no complications, right? No strokes, no bleeding, you know, no problems with the surgery. We are monitoring that, that if this is done carefully, we are not harming our patients. And also, of course, uh, as the most ambitious uh, plan, we are testing for movement improvement. And in the case of multiple systems atrophy, we will also be monitoring for improvement in what we call autonomic problems, right? Drops in, in blood pressure, in particular urinary problems, sexual problems, etc. So all of those are being monitored as well. What kind of risks could someone expect for, for this uh, treatment or clinical trial? This is, a, you know, the, the main question we are trying to answer, the most important question. I can answer you that in, in two ways. You know, I can comment what are the theoretical risks that could happen. And I can also refer to what are the actual risks that we have been monitoring and found. So fortunately, with our experience with exactly the same technique in a cohort of roughly 20 patients with Parkinson's disease, we have not found major risks. And, and we are you know, very, very happy with that. Um, so far, um, for, for the multiple systems atrophy, uh, the Parkinsonian type of multiple systems atrophy patients, uh, for those, we are monitoring for the same, uh, you know, surgical related risks. So we don't want a patient to suffer bleeding during the, the surgery. We also monitor patients for could be uh, immune responses to the, the gene uh, therapy. Fortunately, again, uh, our monitoring with, you know, on the previous patients that have undergone the same intervention has been very, very positive. And this is uh, public data. Has anyone gone through the procedure yet? If through the same procedure, yes. But uh, the MSAP specific individuals, uh, they have been hard to find. You know, we have screened uh, many patients that were very eager to participate. But we found that those patients, in fact, had, a, you know, forms of Parkinson's disease that looked a lot like MSAP, but they were not uh, truly MSAP. So unfortunately, we couldn't select them for this specific study. Who would be considered an ideal candidate for, for this clinical trial and treatment? We are recruiting patients with diagnosis of multiple systems atrophy or MSA of the Parkinsonian type. It's important to know that there are uh, at least two types of uh, multiple systems atrophy. One is the Parkinsonian type, the other is the cerebellar type. So MSAP, Parkinsonian, MSAC, cerebellar. So the ideal or the candidates uh, would be the, the ones that are diagnosed with MSAP that are older than 35 years old. Um, and I think younger than 75, uh, we could double check that in the formal inclusion criteria, um, and that are as early as possible into their, their condition, you know, enough to diagnose that condition, but as early as possible 
they should still be able to uh, walk a, a short a short distance. How soon can we figure out if this is something that could actually be effective? So you you asked the question uh, the the hardest question essentially, essentially what what patients want and patients want the treatment yesterday, right? Um, and we want also the treatment to be available yesterday. But these processes are not as, as fast as we would like them to be, and they take years, you know, uh, going through phase one to phase two, phase three. However, there could be potential breakthroughs, you know, if the results are extremely promising in a condition like this one that does not have alternative treatments, the FDA could, if uh, there is a proper presentation, consider an expedited uh, approval of a therapy, and, and it is possible that patients have access uh, much sooner than, than what is expected. Uh, but again, this will all depend on results of, of the study and if, uh, you know, if uh, the conditions are met to apply for this expedited uh, approval. Do you know when the results would be expected for this round of clinical trials? For this initial round, phase one, I think uh, we can expect results. Uh, unfortunately, it seems too low, but uh, in a, I think uh, two years probably. Do you see us potentially having information sooner that can be shared? Uh, the information is shared usually pretty quickly okay. uh, in international congresses. Uh, so there could be posters, uh, you know, for, for the general public to, to see and, and, you know, analyze, uh, hopefully, hopefully soon. Uh, but I think uh, your role here is also important because uh, we need uh, people to know that the, this trial is available. Uh, although this is a very complex disease that, uh, you know, uh, essentially would compel patients to try to find uh, treatments and, and research options, uh, recruitment has not been so, so uh, easy and straightforward. Uh, you know, we have found patients that did not have the proper diagnosis. So again, more information, more education is very, very important for, for this study. Can you just tell us why this is so important? Like what, I mean, what kind of impact could this have? You know, I want to be extremely ambitious and, and have a, the dream that, that this would slow down the disease, hopefully prevent falls, uh, prevent significant comorbidity. Um, and I would like use uh, I would like to use words as the cure, etc. However, we are very cautious uh, not to um, use these type of words because we are learning. And if we find something that is a major breakthrough, which is our hope, honestly, we do hope that this therapy or similar therapies will be a breakthrough and will prevent um, you know major morbidity or major complications of these disorders hopefully expanding the, the life of these patients. Um, you know, these are our hopes, but we have to be very, very cautious. Uh, so that's why things are taken step by step, right? Safety first, efficacy on a small group later on and in, in a larger group afterwards. Are there any particular metrics or any particular things you're looking at that would help you identify success? Yes, 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 exactly. So we don't not only look for safety, but we are measuring uh, what are these major comorbidities or major outcomes uh, that are problems in this condition. Um, one of the outcomes could be, you know, movement. So we have scales, specific scales to measure movement. When I say that, I mean walking, examination of walking, examination of uh, using your hands, examination of using your legs, and it's checking how, how this is impacting uh, people independence you know can they dress themselves can they feed themselves these are these seem simple things for people that are healthy but to be able to dress yourself to be able to eat and, and you know feed yourself uh, personal hygiene are huge uh, things that allow you to have independence so all of those will be measured uh, in addition to symptoms that are related to what we call this autonomia namely drops in, in blood pressure that can cause people to pass out, uh, urinary problems, all of those are measured and we are hoping to find efficacy or improvement in those problems. Any finishing or final thoughts? Uh, I think a, a more than rational thoughts is the, the hope that this uh, study and similar studies will 
bring a major breakthrough uh, to the suffering of these patients. And I think we can only do this with uh, the, a team, uh, with the collaboration. You being there, uh, us physicians, the industry and the patients. So this uh, alliance uh, is, is the way to go. Dr. Flip, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everything that you're doing and wishing you all the best. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you all and we'll be seeing you soon.